outgoing CEO, Susan Wojcicki, last year was talking on all the, the this very topic uh, in Davos at the World Economic Forum uh, in 2022. I want to play a clip from that just to get a, so everyone can get a sense of how YouTube is thinking about this, you know, from the top, uh, and then get your reaction to the proposals that are being laid out there. Investing a huge amount to make sure that we're fighting misinformation. And there are a number of different ways that we look at, at this. So the first would be from a policy standpoint, we would look at content that we would think about in terms of being violative of our policies. So if you look at COVID, for example, we came up with 10 different policies that we said would be violative. Like an example of that would be saying that COVID came from something other than a virus. And we did see people attacking 5G equipment, for example, because they thought that it was causing COVID. And the second one would be really raising up authoritative information. So if you are dealing with a sensitive subject like news, uh, health, uh, science, we are going to make sure that what we're recommending is coming from a trusted, well-known publisher that can be reliable. If there's content that's borderline content um, that technically meets our policy but is lower quality, that's content that we basically will not recommend to our users. Our users could still access it. And then lastly, we're just really careful about what we monetize. So we always want to make sure that there's no incentive. So for example, with regard to climate change, we don't monetize any kind of climate change material. So there's no incentive for you to keep publishing that material that is propagating something that is generally understood as um, not accurate information. So taking down really blatant uh, misinformation like that 5G towers are, call are mm -hmm. causing uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, deranking certain sources, upranking authoritative sources, and then demonetizing controversial debates that she believes are spreading misinformation. Is that an agenda that you think is a positive one for YouTube to be pursuing? I think uh, it would be great to see them do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're no, not. They're, they're not, not doing that. No. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. they're not doing that. Like, uh, but here, here's my reaction to, to that, because I, I do think it's totally understandable and appropriate for a company like YouTube to not want videos about 5G conspiracies running rampant on a platform. I, I don't agree with that, though. That's not true. They're actually incentivized to have a lot of material like that. In fact, Google came under fire over the last few weeks in terms yeah. of how it's it's spending their ad dollars and not spending them in areas that they told their advertisers they were spending them. Um, so no, I would actually argue that they, that while philosophically they may not like the idea right. that they're monetizing this type of content, they are absolutely monetizing this type of content. But they, they have taken those, the, that sort of stuff. Some of them, there. you can find all yeah. that stuff. It's all that stuff is there on YouTube. All of it is there. Right. The, all the, of it. the flip side to all this is that I've seen what happens when, you know, misinformation has become somewhat of a buzzword, and I've seen what happens when the net uh, is cast too wide. I mean, even Reason TV, we got a strike uh, for, this was a video I produced. It was about these biohackers attempting to kind of create a knockoff uh, COVID vaccine and was called medical inf misinformation. I mean, I just happened to yeah. know the fact that this was not medical misinformation. It was me reporting on something somebody was trying to do. But it got caught, and it, it was like six, seven months after it went up that it got caught in this dragnet. Yeah, uh, and so that is the, that's the kind of impossible thing about regulating misinformation at scale. Uh, you know, whether you're a government or a private company, how do you? Call I don't it? think that's true, though. I don't think impossible is the right word. I think that it's early days, and oftentimes because these companies aren't incentivized to police themselves, they do it very badly. And they do it with a with a blunt hammer as opposed to a scalpel. And it is early, like because for sure, Zach, there are people who create music on on YouTube who get their own content flagged, like yep. really even beyond what the example you just gave, like yeah. really. Uh, we we ha are constantly being accused of infringing our own copyright. Exactly. And that happens all the time. Now, I will this we would need five hours for this yeah. conversation. 
I will tell you, and you know how I feel about this stuff. I made the Napster movie. Yeah. I will tell you that that using copyright and IP law in this area to try to rectify this stuff is generally disastrous, right? Mm -hmm. And I will, and so I'm not like some big, you know, let's just come down on everyone with with mm -hmm. harsher copyright law. It will generally hurt the folks that you're trying to help and help the folks that you're trying to to get yeah. protection from. It's just the way those laws are constructed. Um, so I'm not sitting here saying that stuff is easy, but I will tell you that it's a heck of a lot simpler than people are making it out to be. And you have to start somewhere. So yes, a lot of the tools right now are very blunt, but they will definitely get less blunt as we go along. And we certainly don't want to do nothing. Well, so we can I ask, somewhere. yeah, can I ask about that? Because, you know, in, in a way it seems like you're, you, you want to bring back, or maybe, you know, I realistically it probably has never gone away, but this idea that there's a guardian class that must control what people are exposed to because they really can't handle things. They can't sort things out themselves. Um, and, you know, this goes back to when the novel was introduced, when radio was introduced, movies, you know, comic books, et cetera, rock music in particular, you know, and I think about, uh, you know, your documentary on Zappa, you know, this is redolent with there's certain types of material which should not be permitted. Um, because it will have a negative effect on people who can't understand it or can't critique it. Um, is there, you know, is there a contradiction in what you're saying between, you know, your earlier work and your kind of emphasis on people being allowed to express themselves? No, because I think we're talking about there's an enormous, enormous um, spread there. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're with disinformation being information that is specifically created to cause harm. Um, those are basic safeguards. I don't think there's a lot of, that doesn't enter sort of free speech territory. Um, you know, if, if someone's being called upon to go kill trans people and someone goes right. and kills a trans person, no, I, I think, it, you know. Well, the, if that, it's, I reason. mean, there's fighting it's, words and true threats that are, you know, have been worked through yeah, the Yeah, and there's right? a lot but of I mean, it does showing showing the impact of fighting words on actual fighting. And I think that that is where the arguments for everything being fair game are not valid. Um, right. so, so I, I mean, think, and so yeah. like when Steven Crowder says we need a civil war because my, you know, God, you know, boy, God, Trump is being uh, investigated by the, the FBI, that that crosses a line that, if somebody's saying, you know what, we need a total reordering of society based on recent political events, that would be sure. Okay. I mean, it's also intentionally being done and funded by by some by dark money interests that are trying to create hmm. these harms and this violence. You know, as we saw with the Trump indictment from yesterday, the intention with the January 6th insurrection was to kill the enemy. It was actually to commit that violence. More people were radicalized to go to the January 6th insur insurrection by YouTube than any other internet-based platform. That is a, a study with actual numbers attached to it. So you've got to start somewhere. There's yeah, I'm not, I'm not convinced of that. I mean, January 6th was organized in, you know, WhatsApp groups, Facebook groups. I mean, private you know, uh, encrypted communications, the, the people who showed up But the, there. Prolifer the proliferation and of the ideology was proliferated by YouTube. I mean, the Bellacan study yeah. is, is very comprehensive. I, uh, yeah. You know, the, there, there's um, uh, the, near the end of the film, you start introducing some possible policy prescriptions. You bring up the famous internet law or, you know, very uh, kind of bedrock internet law, section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act. And uh, that uh, is essentially says that platforms are not liable for user generated content on their platforms, right. uh, you know, whether or not they moderate or don't moderate, just, you know, getting involved with moderation does not mean you're suddenly liable for every single thing no. that someone posts on your platform. This has been something that's been attacked by both Democrats and Republicans, mm. and your film seems to also uh, call for some sort of reform needed around Section 230. What is what is it that you would like to see changed about that that fundamental law of the internet? Um, actually, it doesn't. Uh, the right. film doesn't do that. Um, in fact, I would argue that we that our general take, um, not that my take is that important, 
because we're really just trying to show all sides around this debate. But Section 230 is an incredibly difficult uh, thing to reform. And it is really what provides the safeguards for the Internet, period. Um, and tampering with it in a, uh, in a blunt way would actually, as I said before, cause harm to the very people that, um, that, we, that many people would be looking to protect. And it would, it would hyper-empower uh, the monopolies. Um, there's a reason why certain factions in extremist sides of, of political thinking want to abolish 230 because uh, it would essentially um, allow for an enormous amount of censorship um, and it would erase enormous amounts of content from the Internet that is providing very important um, uh, views and and giving voice to people who need voice who would not have it without 230. Um, so my general feeling on this stuff, 230, content moderation, all of it, just to be very clear, is that none of this is easy or simple. And yeah. there really isn't a, there is not a clearly defined way forward to say police the internet or regulate the yeah. internet. There isn't one. Um, my point is that the, the impact of these platforms on society is inarguably huge. Mm -hmm. um, that some of these harms are politically motivated and funded or just ideologically motivated and funded. And that should be called out. And that we shouldn't, as citizens, sit on the sidelines right. and just throw up our hands and say, well, this stuff's too complicated. We shouldn't do anything. We should start to look at what we can do, what, however that looks. I'm not convinced that's by reforming 230 personally. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not... I'm not the head of ethics at Berkeley like Hani Farid is, right? Who mm -hmm. does believe there's a way you should ask Hani, right? So, so Hani how, how very, do you how do you look that. at the revelations of things like the Twitter files and and Reason got a cache of documents from Facebook where, you know, this is also something not quite new, but it, you know, it became apparent that there was a huge amount of government censorship without calling it that, where you know, people in both the Trump administration and the Biden administration, we can uh, certainly assume, you know, George W. Bush and Obama as well, saying to platforms, hey, deprioritize that, kill this, don't push this. Um, does that change the complexity of the task that uh, that is at hand? That this idea that there is, you know, the private sector and the public sector, public speech, private speech is kind of out the window now. I think that it, what it does, which is good, is it shows the specificity of it, which is something we're talking about in the film, that there are ideologies at play. There are political players at play. It isn't just the town square. There are people with agendas that are funded, funded agendas that are giving, that are using this golly gee whiz parasocial influencer to say very specific things or to attempt behind the scenes to curtail the saying of very specific things. So I actually think it's important that we understand mm -hmm. that politics and, and certain uh, players are involved in trying to shape the language or curtail the language that's out there. I think mm -hmm. that's the, look, these are the beginning of conversations that we need to have. This, this is by no means the end of anything. That was an excerpt from our conversation with Alex Winter, the director of the new documentary, The YouTube Effect. Tell us what you think in the comments. And if you wanna see another excerpt, go here, if you want to see the whole conversation, and you should, go here and make sure to come back every Thursday at 1 p.m. on Eastern Time to check out a new live stream from Reason TV.